Um, thank you all for joining us today and, and coming to our Annotate Ed conference. I'm Sonia Visser. I'm a sales manager here at Hypothesis. And I want to introduce um, Shone Jose, who is the assistant professor um, in the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy in Timurti School of Medicine at the University of Toronto. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Sonia. So nice to see you. And thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate that. I'm excited to share with you one of the ways that I use social annotation in my course this year. And I uh, really wanted to kind of get a tool to enhance student engagement and critical thinking specifically from my occupational therapy students. And I embedded it in an ethics discussion group. So when I heard about this conference, I thought, you know, I'm new to hypothesis, new to this experience, but I was really eager to share. Uh, the tool was recently just embedded into the U of T LMS platform, so it made it much easier for me to use. And um, I was a little bit apprehensive about using yet another online tool and wasn't sure about its ease of use or effectiveness. But now that I've had the opportunity to use, utilize it in one of my courses, I think it had a significant impact and uh, was very effective. And I surprisingly found it very easy. My students reported that they found it very easy. So I do think it enhanced the value um, of the learning experience within my course. So I was excited to share. As Sonia said, I am uh, teaching occupational therapy students. So um, I'm sure many of you know what occupational therapy is, but uh, if you don't, we're a regulated healthcare profession and we focus on supporting individuals of all various uh, abilities and ages to participate fully in their lives and the things that they want and need to do, things that are important to them and promote independence and overall well being. And we look at cognition, physical mobility, emotional well being, et cetera. And we provide tailored interventions and activities and adaptive strategies. So I teach, um, for context, I teach a foundational occupational therapy practice course for the first year occupational therapy students and um, prepare them for their field work placements. Over the course of the 24 months, they have a thousand hours in field work. So they might be in a hospital or various clinics or institutions um, or out in community practice. So they complete those hundred hours of field work internships. And for all my foundational courses, um, I teach via Zoom and we have two campuses that we teach simultaneously to. So I have 40 students at one site, which is about 20 miles outside of downtown Toronto. And then I have 90 students in the downtown campus in that classroom. And all, all of our classes are done in person with students and instructors both being in person. This course specifically, my focus is to um, really help these beginning OT students to graduate with a good solid knowledge of OT practice, specifically related to being professionals, meeting regulatory college standards and guidelines. So it's really important that they understand potential and, and actual ethical dilemmas that they're gonna come across in OT practice and prepare them to be able to apply a specific clinical decision-making framework to support their challenges that they're gonna be facing yeah, that are related to ethics. So in this context, I would decided to develop an ethics discussion forum and uh, to support these learning objectives. And of course, like we recognize the importance that uh, preparing healthcare professionals to navigate these complex ethical dilemmas that they're gonna encounter in practice. So to address this, I introduced the ethics decision discussion forum, a very structured interactive learning experience, really focused on meaningful dialogue between peers and critical reflection on these sensitive healthcare topics. The learning objective specifically for this assignment was to help them focus their attention on foundational concepts of ethics, to gain insight into the significance of these in OT practice specifically, and to have these discussions in peer groups and really analyze the ethical complex issues and how these apply to the foundational ethics that we've been exploring. I did have a content advisory for the students because I really, we intentionally chose selected um, essential knowledge for OTs that address subject areas that may arise in clinical practice, but these are tricky areas. So the three articles were based on assistive dying. In Canada, we have a legislation that uh, allows patients to choose assistive death. 
uh, COVID-19 and manage resources and limitations that happened during the pandemic with who could get health care and what kind of health care they could get and the limitations of resources in the healthcare system at that time. And of course, healthcare provider burnout and the impact that has on some of the decisions we make and some of the ethical considerations around that. So it's a tricky subject. I did have students um, reach out to me if there was challenges for them related to these topics and I ensured that they had uh, access to the mental health supports and were reminded of all the available supports for them in the university. The overview of the project was to, you know, I gave the ethical dilemmas so students were introduced to the articles. Uh, we had established class agreements in the class pri prior to this and then reminded them of this and talked about specific norms related to discussion, active listening, being, having creating a respectful, inclusive environment. Because again, these are tricky, uh, tricky discussions, some challenging for them personally and then bringing their, um, you know, discussions in a professional way to each other. They did small group preparation. This class is all divided into study groups. So they have consistent study groups across the whole term. And then they were required to do individual preparation. And this is where I used um, and leveraged the annotation, uh, the social annotation using the hypothesis platform, which was great. And then they engaged in the peer-to-peer -peer dialogue. And this was not in their study groups. So students were uh, tasked with becoming the specialists on these topics or kind of the topic expert. And then they were organized into discussion groups, which were different from their study groups in kind of a jigsaw pattern. And then we had a large class debrief after. So the actual process was to have the study groups read the article and kind of discuss it in depth, kind of highlight. I had given them some questions that they had to attend to. Uh, comparing it to kind of the ethics, uh, foundational materials, the theories, et cetera, that we had discussed in class and were on their preparatory materials. And then they had to annotate and I gave them some guidelines for that, which I'm gonna share. And then they prepared some specific discussion questions with which they had to hand in in advance. And then the pairs or there's sometimes there was trios facilitated uh, peer discussion in these ethics discussion groups. We did have the guidelines for ethics discussions because the topics were, you know, more challenging. And uh, so we wanted to ensure that they had the expectations and boundaries were set to ensure that the participation was, of course, respectful, creating a productive learning environment, making sure that there was open dialogue and um, sharing that, ensuring that the needs and perspectives of different students were um, it was available, they could feel like they could voice their opinion because those challenging conversations, of course, are important, especially in, in healthcare and being prepared to discuss these in a collegial collaborative way. And uh, of course, we did reiterate, we can't create a safe environment. Their learning is you know, gonna be uncomfortable sometimes, but we wanted to create a safer, more inclusive environment that we could. And uh, I think having the opportunity to individually annotate and reflect on the topic and take some time to do that individually really helped with something with these kind of more difficult topics. So why did I choose social annotation? Um, I had never used this. I've used discussion boards previously and I find, I felt they kind of were sometimes flat. I didn't get a lot of responses or I didn't get a lot of engagement. Um, it was kind of like, you know, they would do the required posts, but it wasn't kind of like building off each other and using that uh, to deepen their learning. So when I saw this uh, platform, I'm like this might give me what I've been looking for to have that uh, development of those, of that critical thinking as a group. And I think that when I was asking students to kind of become the experts in these topics and then go present to peers that they may not know so well, I think it gave them a bit more comfort um, and more security and kind of like building their understanding and kind of a, a collective way of the group. So I think that um, having that uh, benefit from diverse perspectives as well. I have students in my class who are a little bit more hesitant to speak verbally because they have to 
come on a mic, they have to be, they're on Zoom across two campuses. So being comfortable and brave enough to come on mic and speak across to 134 students is not always comfortable. So this gave another opportunity for those students who might have not always voiced their opinion verbally in my class to have a chance to post their comments. And some of the students that, you know, when I went and looked over the annotations, I could see some of those students who are more quiet in my class were actively participating, asking questions, um, being vulnerable. So I really was appreciative of the this kind of platform. And I remember also, you know, annotating my textbook on my own, not really knowing what my peers were thinking about the text. Here was a way for students to kind of see clearly and be, you know, inspired or encouraged by what their peers were thinking about the course materials. Building that collegial collaboration too, I think was so important, especially for our future healthcare professionals. The criteria I had set up for them um, was to ensure that they it had relevance. So it had some deeper insights and they were, in, you know, enriching the discussion, adding to the discussion that there was some depth to it. Um, that it gave some valuable insights to their peers and that they were moving the discussion forward and they were fostering those those uh, those thoughts that you know that critical engagement and they were asking questions and um, encouraging their peers to think about things more deeply. Here's an example of um, some of the types of annotations I got. So I see that the students were they were highlighting, they were, you know, highlighting specific text, they were highlighting specific passages, they were adding comments and questions for their peers. They were also asking questions and answering questions to each other to foster critical thinking and create some problem solving um, collaboratively. They were also connecting and relating to other materials, so to other texts, to their own experiences, to other current events. You see somebody posted a news article here just to help deepen their understanding and promote that interdisciplinary thinking. Another example was, I was um, not entirely surprised, but it did surprise me the depth of the vulnerability. Um, and students were really coming to the text with, you know, really articulating their own biases or their own misperceptions. And here you see a student was talking about their own biases and how you know the change that the text helped uh, promote for them. So I think that critical reflexivity is so important and valuable, especially uh, in the times that we're living in and uh, being able to articulate that and then share that with a peer, it, you're quite vulnerable. And I think that uh, I was really happy to see how this prepared them for the actual ethics discussions where they were actually sharing and being very vulnerable and uh, developing their analytical skills, questioning, and furthering the conversation there. Some of the students had comments such as, you know, where they were connecting and relating materials to previous materials they had learned within the course or within the previous term or even to, to their undergraduate materials. Um, so I was happy to see this highlighted. So overall, I think, I mean, this was a, a new experience for me, and um, I have used discussion boards and uh, like a Google Doc kind of thing to our Padlet, um, but having the text right there and then the conversation within the text, I think um, made a meaningful difference for the students. I think that, you know, these are my kind of thoughts and feelings and perceptions and of the TA and the other instructor and for this class and the facilitators, but what we noticed was there was definitely an increase in student engagement that day. There was a lot of high energy. Students were enthusiastic. I didn't see them on their phones or behind their laptops. They were clearly um, ready for conversation. They were well prepared. They had done the active reading of the course materials. And of course, um, that's always a struggle to ensure have they read the course materials? Are they prepared for, their, for the discussions? and uh, really seemed to foster that peer-to-peer -peer learning. I think it would have been different if it had just been me presenting the article, but having the, their peer and divided up into multiple discussion groups really made a difference. 
you know, facilitators and I would walk around and uh, there was a lively conversation. Students were really engaged, fostering that uh, more collaborative learning environment, which we want them to be prepared for, for when they go into clinical practice. I do think that improved their clinical, their critical thinking skills and because um, they were practicing summarizing, synthesizing, you know, making those new connections. And I think that they really showed a deeper engagement with course materials than sometimes we had uh, seen before. And I could see the work that they had done. So when I read the annotations, I could see that engagement. And I think it really prepared them for um, their final summative assignment where they have to do a presentation related to navigating a clinical ethical challenge that's a real world challenge. They interview an occupational therapist who presents a clinical a challenge that they're currently facing. And so I think they were really prepared because they had the understanding, the underlying um, perspective foundation of the ethics there to then go into the clinical practice and help navigate those tricky issues. So I think it's a powerful pedagogical approach to kind of encourage active, collaborative, constructivist learning. And um, I think it did enhance the student engagement for this uh, project. The feedback, I did ask students specifically for feedback. Uh, some of the comments were they wanted more time, even in on the day of, it was hard to get students to come back for the overall large class debrief. They wanted to stay in their groups and continue the conversation. Lots of students, more than usual, stayed well after class and wanted to continue the discussions. They were um, re remarking about how much they had enjoyed the approach. I mean, they had to take a lot of initiative and do the preparation and then come prepared and then lead the discussion. So it was a lot of work on their part, but they were very engaged and highly motivated to do it. Some of the comments on the anonymous feedback form was that they realize how ethics plays a very big role in OT and they hadn't previously thought about that. So I was like, fantastic. That's one of the main learning objectives for this, uh, or this activity. They start to think about the differences between rules, morality, and ethics, and they had start to really think about that, which was, again, in alignment with the learning objectives I had, and that when students remarked, there's no correct one correct answer in ethics, but you have a team to support you, which is really what I wanted them to come away with, that, you know, there's lots of ways and lots of perspectives to look at it and to have that more critical, reflexive approach, um, but yet, you're working in a collaborative team approach when you were in healthcare. And in fact, 88% of the students answered the ethics related questions on the midterm correctly. So I was pretty, uh, pretty thrilled with that. In terms of reflecting on my overall experience, I was a little hesitant, like I said, about how easy it would be, how user friendly it would be yet another platform but the students found it easy. I actually found it very easy to navigate. I really liked being able to see the number of social annotations. I think we had almost a thousand social annotations um, over the three articles in the 134 students. So they were very engaged with, the, with each of the articles. I think it gave them an opportunity to think more deeply and engage more deeply with the materials, which prepared them for these um, the ethics discussion forum, and I think it gave them some more critical thinking and that hidden curriculum of developing those interpersonal skills, being able to respond to their peers in the social annotation and as well um, preparing them for those face-to-face -face discussions. So I would devote more class time to this specific. I think um, one class was not sufficient and take more time for the debriefing, maybe more opportunities in different ways. And definitely for my next semester, I will be embedding social annotation in other ways, in addition to kind of the course materials, even something like the syllabus. I'm like, that would be a great way to see what their questions are, what they've read, have they read it. Um, so I'm kind of thinking of different ways to use it. And uh, I have lots of time for questions. I wanted to know and understand um, if you think this is a way that if you've done this, um, is this kind of a strategy that you feel that you could use for your own? I know we have nurses and other healthcare providers 
on here if there's other ways that you think um, you could use this kind of approach. Love to hear from you. And I have my contact information here. Um, I'm happy to connect with anybody who's interested. Sure, I have a question for folks here that are thinking about um, embarking in social imitation or using hypothesis. What are some, um, you know, ideas or tips you would give them to to get them started? Great question. I I was a bit scared because I wasn't sure what I was going to get, and uh, you know, I wasn't sure exactly how to use it, but it was actually very easy. So. Definitely choosing some materials that you really want to make sure that they read. So they're, you know, you want to think about what is it that's critical for their learning to move them forward in your course. So choosing some materials that uh, are relevant and important for you. And then again, I think one thing that I would have done differently is to annotate something fun that like maybe the syllabus or some other kind of activity it could be I don't know a comic strip or something just so they get a sense and a feel for it and give them a bit more guidance they did really well so I didn't feel like in, they were missing that but I think that would have been a great structure to have them um, do that and to have that as a practice run that's great we do have a question here um, and if you want to um, take a stab at it. I can also answer a little bit too here, but um, this uh, one of the participants says, when you integrate hypothesis into Canvas, is it like you created a hypothesis discussion for each reading? So I set it up by study group because I wanted the study groups just to interact with each other. And I want to kind of build that comfort for them. And I think you could do it either way. You could set it up as a reading and then everybody's annotating that one reading, or you could set it up in terms of smaller groups. And that was important to me because these were challenging, more tricky topics, and I wanted them to feel vulnerable. They know their study group, so they didn't have any kind of concern about what they were saying, and they asked each other questions, and sometimes they said, I don't even know how to phrase this, um, you know, correctly or the most uh, appropriate, And but the students know each other pretty well. So for me, that was important. For an, another topic that it was like learning about how to document or how to obtain consent from a client, I might just have open it to the whole class and then have everybody kind of respond. So I think you could do it either way. Um, we had another one, again, speaking about groups. When setting up in smaller groups, do you need to add the LTI link to the same article many times once per group? Um, yes. And um, if you're using it in the in, in a Canvas or in one of the um, LMSs, you would be creating those groups within the within the learning management system um, beforehand before you create the assignment with yes, uh, exactly. sustainable reading. Yep. So you'd want to have your your groups created and you can in your most LMS you can have study groups or you know groups that are manually assigned by you or sometimes you can have the students pick. Um, and I I think that would be an, another fun way to do it next time to have students choose the article that's most intriguing to them or the area, the topic area. So I think that would be a really fun way and then have students set up in groups. And then you do need to set up the different uh, groups for the hypothesis assignment. Has anyone used this approach before embedded in a in-person class? Because I know it would, I wish I had used it during COVID when we were teaching online because it would have been really beneficial. And I wasn't sure if it was going to be, uh, you know, work for the in-person, but it, I think it really gave them time to think more deeply. We have another question, not the one you just asked there, but how do you manage uh, marking the students? So I guess grading the students. Yeah, so having a clear rubric. So I found that helpful. Um, so I had those three points, you know, the depth and the content and did it move the conversation forward. So that was what I used to grade the students. It was worth 3%. So it was a pretty easy win for them. And they all had 100% participation. Um, they're all eager for all the, the points. And it was early in the term. So it was kind of a low stakes, easy way for them to, you know, get some immediate marks. 
And I will say, um, hypothesis does inter when, when it does integrate in all the grade books and all of our LMSs. So in Canvas, it's Speed Grader. You know, in in D2L, Moodle. But I mean, all, all of the other LMSs, it, it looks a little differently. But we do integrate right into the grade book, so um, you don't have any manual um, grading you have to do there. And you can see how many students participated, like how many annotations they did. So you get some good feedback that way. Um, we have a couple of comments um, here from the earlier question you posed, who's using it? Um, and um, we've got uh, one that says, I've, uh, she's paired it, Bethany has paired it with some other quote unquote weird approaches to reading where students, after doing a class social annotation as their lecture prep, they had to come to class and draw the paper on whiteboards in small groups, gives them a chance to continue conversations and wrestle with some of the concepts. Oh, Bethany, I love that. I'm going to steal that idea. I think that's great. I do think having time just individually to kind of think about the materials makes them come much more prepared to class. Um, so yeah, that's a great idea. I love that. Um, we had someone else here. Um, Joe said, yes, it's effective for helping prep for discussions and having those discussions during class. That's what I found. So yeah, definitely, I think I'll embed it and use it a use it more in my next term because I think just knowing that they're coming prepared with the materials is very helpful on my end. <laughs> Well, we only have a couple more minutes left. So if anyone else has, has any other questions, um, let me go over here. I think we've answered those. Yeah, if anyone wants to reach out, I'm always happy to uh, share and learn from each other. I love new education ideas. All right. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Um, we have our expo open. So if you have any other um, questions, please go in there or want to see anything, go into, um, we have two booths in there. So um, please feel free to join there. And then um, we've got more sessions this afternoon. So uh, thank you, Shown, so much for the, the presentation today. It was wonderful. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. So nice to be here. Appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody.